Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Coming up, we take a look at the very latest research into long COVID. But first, here are the numbers as they stand. The number of cases detected nationally has continued to fall in the last five weeks. The seven-day average is now around 11,500. Hospitalisations have also declined. There are currently 2,860 people in hospital with COVID-19. 74 are in intensive care. On average, 51 people are still dying of COVID each day in Australia. So from next week, if you test positive for COVID-19, you'll only have to isolate for five days instead of seven. That's if you don't have any symptoms. And if you work in high-risk settings, such as aged or disability care, those rules won't apply to you you still have to isolate for a whole week in those circumstances. The Prime Minister announced the changes after a meeting of National Cabinet. There aren't uh, mandated uh, requirements for the flu or for a range of other uh, illnesses that people can suffer from. And what we want to do is to make sure uh, that government responds to uh, the changed circumstance, uh, the COVID is likely to be around uh, for a considerable period of time and we need to respond appropriately to it based upon uh, the weight of evidence. So now the Australian Medical Association wants the government to release the health advice that led to that decision. Professor Rainer McIntyre is an epidemiologist and the head of biosecurity at the Kirby Institute. She joins us now. Professor, welcome to the program. Firstly, congratulations on winning the 2022 Eureka Award for Innovation uh, Leadership in Science and Innovation. That's a big deal of recognition to you and your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what do you think of the changes to the isolation period? Well, I think it's important to ask what's the problem that we're trying to solve. And the problem is uh, loss of business continuity because there's so much COVID around and, um, you know, workplaces can't function effectively. And so this is a stopgap solution to try to improve business continuity. But it's probably going to do the reverse, which is make things worse. And that's because a substantial proportion of people, anywhere between one-third to two-thirds are still infectious after five days. So if you send people back to work, and they can be infectious without symptoms. Um, so if you send people back to work, you're A, you're creating an unsafe workplace for other people, and B, um, you're going to have more transmission. So how do you think we landed at this five days of isolation? Not four, not six, but exactly five. What's that about? Well, I think it's just a gradual whittling down of mitigations of transmission. Um, you know, when the pandemic started, the period of isolation was even longer. Um, and I think we've already heard um, there's calls to scrap the isolation period already. So I think it's just a slippery slope to um, getting rid of all mitigations, which, which isn't going to work. We can pretend... COVID's finished, but it's not finished. It, you know, we'll, we'll have other waves probably this year and we're just going to bring them on faster and make them bigger by removing mitigations. So other countries have already gone down this path. What is their experience of reducing the isolation period? So the UK, um, for example, which um, allows people to go back to work infected, um, has had ma a massive economic hit their economy has gone backwards. Um, employers are reporting that up to uh, one in four workers are unable to work in the same capacity due to long COVID. So the long COVID is now also affecting business continuity um, and it's only going to keep getting worse there. So that's not what we should be emulating. So vaccination status now becomes more decisive in the spread and severity of COVID. How well do the current vaccinations hold that front line? Um, two doses does not prevent transmission much at all. Unfortunately, it'll probably prevent you getting very seriously ill, but even that protection wanes with two doses. Three doses does better, but again, also wanes you, if you're, you know, everyone who's eligible for a third dose should get it. Our third dose rates are not 
high enough. We know we can get very high rates of vaccination in Australia. We, we've done so for the two doses. Um, so if we can get the third doses up and also um, everyone who's eligible for a fourth dose gets it then, um, and if we get these um, new Omicron matched boosters out as soon as possible, um, we, we would be in a better position, but still vaccines alone are not enough. Um, they still wane and, and you need other mitigations and the isolation period is one of those mitigations. It is a way of stopping transmission because you're not, uh, you're preventing infected people from going out and infecting others. Professor, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. So new international research has emerged connecting long COVID with serious brain and heart complications. To tell us more is Dr Norman Swan. Uh, Norman, how credible is this new research? Oh, it's, it's very credible. It's probably the best to date. None of, these, none of these research projects are ideal because they're a look back in time. Ideally, if we'd had uh, foresight and know, knew what the scope of the pandemic was going to be, we'd have started studies and followed groups of people through. So we're looking back. But what they've done is they've taken people who've had COVID, um, household and non-household con uh, contacts, and then followed them through for up to two years and then looked back comparing them to another group of people who'd had respiratory infections that weren't COVID. And they also knew what conditions they had before COVID hit them through electronic records in various countries, largely the United States. And therefore were to say, well, look, they had it before, that wasn't COVID. They got it after COVID, it's likely to be COVID. And when you compare it to other people with respiratory infections, was it a higher risk? So it's, it's as good as you get really at the moment with this COVID data. And how long lived are these secondary complications that develop after a person's had COVID? So they were, they were really looking at the risk and how long the risk lasted. So they looked, for example, at so one of the good news stories here was the to depression and anxiety. So depression, and, the risk of depression and anxiety did go up after you got your COVID infection, but it lasted one or two months and then the risk went back down to normal. In fact, there's a suggestion that it even went below normal, but I think you can probably disregard that. The really worrying thing is they looked at a range of conditions, cognitive deficit, cognitive decline, dementia, respiratory problems, cardiac problems, and so on. The risk of those did not go down with time. They stayed up for the, you know, the, the maximum follow-up they got from this study was about two years, and those risks stayed um, at, a reason, at a significant level. Not huge, but significant. And what that means is you're accumulating people who are developing dementia, psychotic disorders, cognitive deficit, that's fog, and so on. So in, in other words, and going back to what Rhino was saying about isolation, going down to five days means you're just going to accelerate this because 70% 70, 70 of people are still infectious. There's going to be another variant almost certainly later on in the year. And we're going to grow the number of people with quite serious side effects from the virus. This is not the flu. Do these risks extend to children? They do, but the good news in children is that they are less prevalent and they do decline. So they don't decline, these, these serious side effects don't decline in adults, at least up to two years, but they do decline in children after about a year. Is it the case that if you didn't develop secondary complications the first time you had COVID, that you're likely going to be in the clear the next time you get COVID no. or the time after that? You roll the dice every time. So the, that, that's the problem, is that the risk are, at a minimum stays the same next time around. So if it, let's say it's a 2% risk, hypothetically, it's 2% next time. And so if you missed out last time, you roll the dice at 2% next time. And some people would argue that the risk actually goes up next time. This virus is not behaving the way they expected. You'd expect the risk to go down. It's not going down. It's staying the same or going up. This study also looked at the impact of different variants. Is there a distinction between different variants and the likelihood of developing those other risk factors? They made an assumption on the variants in this study um, that Omicron, and the, the highest risk they got was, some, was one person, I think it was, with Omicron. I can't, I can't remember exactly. But the, a, crit, criti, a critique of the study suggested that, that that's the one part of the study that you can't really rely on, is really how much difference there were between variants. Because if you can imagine this is a follow-up study, the longest follow-up is for Wuhan, the original virus, Alpha, Delta, and it's a pretty short follow-up for Omicron. So you can't say too much about the variants. Uh, there is more and more data coming out that people who are suffering these secondary complications, things like long COVID, it's really affecting their ability to work, isn't it? Yes, and, and I think you need to distinguish long COVID 
from what from, the, from this yeah. this study. I mean, yes, there's cognitive deficit and brain fog, but they they're finding dementia, they're finding chronic lung problems, chronic heart problems. Some countries are reporting excess cardiac deaths in people who've had in the community, and they're wondering whether COVID is actually the cause here. This is not benign. I know I've said it before. I'll say it again. Norman, thank you. You're welcome. Now, studies into long COVID are being conducted around the world, including several here in Australia. For the past year, Dr Erin Howden from the Baker Institute has been researching long COVID. She joins us now to talk about what she's found so far. Dr Howden, your study's been going for more than a year. What have you found? Yeah, so our study's really been trying to understand some of these ongoing symptoms that uh, Dr Swan was just referring to, um, especially focusing on long uh COVID and fatigue. Um, so we know that that's one of the most common ongoing symptoms that um, patients experience. And what we heard from um, the long COVID clinics in Melbourne was that um, symptoms were, or patients were also reporting symptoms that were suggestive of potential cardiac abnormalities or cardiac dysfunction, um, arrhythmias and autonomic dysfunction. And so our study really sought to try and understand whether these were contributing to uh, patients' fatigue um, and, um, yeah, what we could learn from that to try and um, help patients with long COVID. Part of the study investigates why some people are affected more than others. Are there pre-existing biological conditions at play? There are. Our, our study doesn't in particular look at the pre-existing factors that contributed, but others have. And we know that um, female sex is a contributing factor, um, poorer pre-pandemic health, um, including mental health also precipitates someone's risk to developing long COVID. Um, and, and these are factors that have been published um, in the literature. Why is it, do you think, that women are more susceptible than men? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for that. And I think we're still trying, you know, we're still learning a lot about what um, increases the risk for long COVID. Um, certainly in our study, some of the, the uh, initial observations are that uh, participants are experiencing ongoing fatigue and this is associated with uh, autonomic dysfunction. And the particular type of autonomic dysfunction that we're seeing is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So in about 40% of our um, participants with long COVID or fatigue, um, we're detecting that they also have evidence of this condition, which is more common in women, um, particularly young women. Uh, it's also a condition that is has been associated with viral illness um, previously. So it's not surprising that we're seeing an increase um, in of POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome in people who've recovered from or otherwise recovered from COVID but are experiencing long COVID symptoms. Um, so, I mean, that's that's one of the initial interesting observations from the study. You mentioned young people there as well. I mean, young people have also been affected. Given that so much of the risk profile focuses on people who are older in the older cohort, was that surprising to you? That was really surprising. Um, these participants from our study were otherwise young, healthy, highly functioning individuals who, um, for whatever reason, have not been able to recover from COVID, um, are still experiencing these debilitating symptoms of fatigue, which um, are impacting their ability to um, live their fulfilling lives, work, um, contribute to society, as we've heard earlier. So um, that has been really surprising. I, I guess one um, you know, thing to be optimistic about is that symptoms do seem to subside with time in most individuals. Um, we, most of the people in our study were about one year post their initial infection. Um, and a lot of the people were reporting that their symptoms were, were slowly improving. So that makes me feel a little bit optimistic for, the, for this group. Increasingly, vaccines, we're relying on more and more to be part of that front line. To what extent does that offer a defence against long COVID? Yeah, I think the preliminary evidence from the, this work has also suggests that vaccines can um, reduce the rates of long COVID. Dr Erin Howden, thank you so much. Thank you. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. From all of us, bye for now.